present. Honorary members, ladies and gentlemen, I come from the northeast of England, <laughs> and at the age of 62, I finally made it to Oxford. <laughs> Let me introduce you to my daughter, Rachel. She was educated at the Mountbatten Comprehensive School in Romsey, and Alice, I have to report, to Peter Simmons Sixth Form College in Winchester, where in her year, 45 of the pupils went to Oxford or Cambridge. From there, she read her undergraduate degree at the University College London and her master's at the London School of Economics, where she met and married Pablo from Mexico. <laughs> and things have gone downhill for long. <laughs> to posit that attracting Rachel because she was a state school pupil to Oxbridge is widening participation and increasing social mobility to the disadvantaged is utter nonsense. She is definitely social class one from a very advantaged background in a family that was a bit ambitious for her, probably before she was conceived, but certainly before she was born. She is from the same middle class as those friends of hers who went to independent school. My apologies, Madam President, if I've laboured the point, but the motion for fails because it is simply factual that attendance at either a private or state school is a hopelessly inaccurate discriminator of social difference or disadvantage. Furthermore, there are 164 state-maintained selective grammar schools in England, most of which are concentrated in London and the South East, the South West and the West Midlands, the natural geography for applications to Oxbridge. These schools are academically selective and provide excellent teaching to an outstanding peer group of pupils. Again, this is not about widening participation. It's about admitting a slightly different middle class who go to these state schools. So on top of poor discrimination, we have a major definitional problem as to what a state school is in terms of its educational background. Furthermore, there are some independent schools who, because of their admission, uh, their mission admits students who are less able. At Bristol, we identify schools in the lowest 40% of performers, which is not a reflection often of the standard of teaching, so much more than the demography of the pupils they admit. There are some independent schools in that lowest 40%. Actually, admitting pupils to Oxbridge from those schools may be much more about widening participation and social mobility than admitting the Rachels of this world. I have to agree with my honourable friend from Merton. Uh, I like to think philosophically that I don't like to think about rights, I like to think about duties. The 18-year-old in front of you asking admission to your university has not been responsible for their choice of education. And if you regard that you actually have duties to autonomous individuals, then it is inappropriate to bias against that person for choices that they actually did not make themselves. On the point of information, isn't the entire point not to create bias, but rather to reverse bias? And isn't that fair? Mm -hmm. now I, fair enough. I'm thinking about the duties owed to that particular individual. That's the point I'm making. On the point of information, this isn't really about individuals. It's about society. I fail to see how the choice of admission of a single person to a university is not about that individual. I have to say I disagree with Alice. The imposition of a quota would mean that Oxbridge would have to admit some students who are not as academically well prepared for the experience at these two universities. I know, having talked to young people who come to these universities, how challenging and demanding your pedagogy is. It's a catastrophe for the individual, their family and the universities, if they are admitted and are almost inevitably going to fail. 
you also have a very high octane peer group. To admit someone who would be unable to survive in that peer group would be very damaging to them. But this brings me to the final reason why quotas are such a bad idea. They imply that the problem is Oxbridge's. And as long as the universities fix their actions, the problem will be solved. The majority of this problem is not Oxbridge's. A report by Alison Richard, the ex-Vice-Chancellor of Cambridge, and Steve Smith, the Vice-Chancellor of Exeter, to Gordon Brown when he was Prime Minister, showed unequivocally that the main issue with poor access to our elite universities from individuals from some state schools was simply lower prior attainment. In other words, these pupils were not achieving the requisite entry criteria. To be blunt, they were not being taught to a high enough standard to fulfill the entry requirements. The individuals responsible for the quality of such provision over more than the last 40 years are a sequence of Secretaries of State for Education and Prime Ministers of both major political parties. They are the people responsible for the state of affairs of quality of education in some parts of our state sector. But of course, the last thing that any politician will do will be to admit to poor stewardship of something as important as state education. So they thrash around trying to find anybody to blame but themselves. And it's very, very easy in these circumstances to paint universities as elite and uncaring about the problem and to continue to paint a picture redolent of Brideshead. Such a story is easy for the press to narrate and fills a very, very real public perception. It is an excellent mechanism to allow them to divert the blame elsewhere and we should not allow them to do that. So I conclude, quotas are unworkable and inappropriate. Attendance at state school is too blunt an instrument to identify disadvantage. Some state schools have highly selective education. Quotas would mean the admission of some students ill-prepared for the academic reality of Oxbridge. And finally, quotas would continue to divert the accountability from those who are responsible for fixing this problem are political leaders. I beg to oppose. <laughs>